Hey, welcome back to the About the Labor podcast here at VikingsTerritory.com. I am BJ Rydell, back here with my guy, Drew Mahold. And today, uh, for I believe now the sixth week in a row, we are talking about a Minnesota Vikings victory. Um, they stay at home at U.S. Bank Stadium, get a big, big, massive W over the Los Angeles Rams by a multiple score margin, a convincing victory against um, a team that many consider to be the top NFC power, a humongous victory for the Vikings, a humongous victory for Case Keenum, um, Latavius Murray, Adam Thielen, the defense, so many strong performances in this one. Um, so we, we, you know, we should just jump right into this because there's a lot to cover in a short amount of time here. So here's the word from our sponsor real quick, SOCOM Creative. Is your website ugly? It's time for an upgrade. It's almost 2018. If your website doesn't look like it doesn't look good on a smartphone, you are losing money. That's just how it is. It's time to call an audible. Take your business to the next level with a professional quality website or mobile app and thank us later. The world is changing. It's time to score touchdowns. Stop missing field goals. If you want your business to grow online, you need a web, social media, and mobile presence that gets the job done. SoCom Creative, they build apps, websites, and create winning strategies. Check them out at www.so comcreative.co that's socomcreative.co all right let's jump right into this starting off with our guy case keenum um i mean what can you really say about this guy at this point um i think that the discussion is going to be kind of inherent to this uh to this episode of the about the labor podcast but you know case keenum comes out with you know i know he has played better statistically in the past but I think this is kind of this is the best performance we've ever seen from Case Keenum in a number of different ways. First and foremost, obviously you're playing against a very good team. Last week against Washington, we gave him credit for beating a good team. Now he beat a quote elite team, or at the very least, an elite offense. Um, he gets the W here today. He gets the Vikings over that 21 point plateau. Could have gotten him all the way up to 30 if Kai Forbath didn't miss a couple of kicks. Um, so he is leading, you know a very solid offense, an offense that appears at this point um, to be good enough to beat just about anyone. Uh, and that includes the Rams, obviously, now. So what did you think of Case Keenum's day today? Um, I thought, for the most part, this was one of the more even performances um, that we've seen from him across the board from start to finish, as opposed to the Case uneven num that we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I, thought the, I thought it was – he was iffy early, I thought, just yeah. because I thought the Rams kind of um, – I mean, obviously, I think the first quarter, they kind of set the tone in the game. Um, I mean, as far as getting out to a hot start, I thought both sides of their ball for the Rams did. Um, but, uh, you know, the Vikings settled in. Case Keenum settled in. Um, and then once, you know, Latavius Murray had a couple nice runs in there, the running game got established. Again, that opened up that play-action pass. Um, you know, Case Keenum has been phenomenal this season in play-action. Uh, Adam Thielen and Stefan Diggs were making plays. Kyle Rudolph made a couple really nice catches mm -hmm. in this game. Yeah. So, you know, if I, I, get, I agree with what you're saying with Case Keenum. It was one of the more even, even performances of the season. Uh, and it's just, you know, and we can talk, we'll talk, get into the, you know, should he be named a starter for the rest of the season or not here shortly. But I think simply put, today was a big deal for Case Keenum because it's his former team. Yeah. Uh, and you have, it's a statement win for the team as a, in general for the Vikings. But, mm -hmm. This was kind of, you know, for me, this was kind of the make or break for Case Keenum. You have a defense that's top five in the league, and you have, um, you know, on the other side of the ball, you have an offense that's top five in the league, too, for the Rams. So it was a big day for Case Keenum. Could he, could he keep this offensive production sustainable against a really, really good football team and lead the Vikings to a crucial win that's going to have several playoff implications? And his game didn't, you know, flounder in any way. Uh, so I think that, you know, his floor is what it is, and it's pretty high. And so in this whole Teddy Case debate, um, you, I think at this point we have a pretty good understanding of what we're going to get from Case Keenum, and it's pretty solid. Right, yeah, we've been talking for the last couple of weeks that we know who Case Keenum is, um, and if you're okay with that, good. Then Case Keenum is your starting quarterback, and you know he should be named as such. Uh, but the opposite side to that was if you don't believe in Case Keenum, um, then possibly you fall in the Teddy Bridgewater category. That's the group that I've been in over the last couple of weeks here. Now, I think today's game actually changes that to a degree because we saw something from Case Keenum that we have never seen from him before. Um, and there's no reason to suggest that he can't come out and do the same thing again. And that's beat an actually good team. Um, mm -hmm. with more than just defense. You know, he had a lot of help. This is a definitely, a, you know, a team win for sure. 
But Case Keenum certainly led the charge here. I mean, did he not? He was putting his guys in the position. The last two weeks now, he's really – he has led the charge. Yeah, he's – you know, he's putting his guys in a position to make plays on the ball. And there were – you know, I'll admit it. There was a couple of plays where I was like, eh, he probably could have thrown that ball a little bit better and, you know, maybe given his receivers an opportunity after the catch or something like that. Um but for the most part, he was doing everything that a quote starting quarterback does. Um, and again, I can't—I mean, I can't reiterate this point enough. He did this against a truly elite, well-rounded team. Uh, that's the biggest thing here. And so, for me, when you evaluate that type of performance, you have to evaluate it. You know, it's a small sample size; it's one game. But now you've got two weeks consistently against good teams with with quality play, and basically. Two dumb decisions that didn't even matter last week in Washington. Um, we can nitpick all we want with those, but uh, end of the day, it seems like Case Keenum is getting stronger as the season goes on, as you would expect for most quarterbacks. Mm-hmm. Um, but you have to love that at this point. You know, the Vikings are truly becoming a powerhouse in the NFC, and Case Keenum is not a detractor of that anymore. He's actually a pretty big part of it. Right, and. Um... You know, I think with Case Keenum, you have to look at. Um, I mean, I, first of all, I'm going to address what I think Judd Zelga said this on Twitter today. Uh, the whole Teddy Case debate, we're talking about it because it's still relevant because Mike Zimmer has not right ended it yet. You know, he's still leaving the door open for Teddy Bridgewater to start. He hasn't announced the starter for the rest of the season, and once he does that, we can kind of put this thing to rest and it won't be talked about. But until he does that, this is still a relevant discussion. And, you know, I, another thing, too, I thought about with Case Keenum is it's very possible that this Case Keenum that we're seeing right now has been the same Case Keenum his entire career. And he just has been in a crappy situation within in Houston and with the Rams. You know, both of those offenses, from what I remember, have not been very potent, um, especially when he was you know playing or starting for them. And so you get that same caliber player and you get him a top 10 offensive line. You get him a running game that's averaging 130 yards a game right now. Um, that's even without Delvin Cook since yep. week five. Uh, and then you have you know Adam Thielen, Stephon Diggs, one of the top receiving duos in the league. You get all of that into a guy that's of Case Keenum caliber, and things inherently improve. And yep. I think that's what's happening here. I think you know his passer rating. I think believe it going into this year is something like 82 or 83. Yeah. Uh, and now it's up in the you know low to mid 90s. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a lot of that is just because of his supporting cast and who he's playing with, and that it inherently will elevate a quarterback's play. And I think that's simply what we have to consider here now in this Teddy Case debate is, you know, on the flip side, the same Teddy Bridgewater from the past is probably going to be elevated to some degree in the same way Ke- Keenan right. has been. Yeah, you know, he, this this conversation right here is going to bleed right into um, that ongoing quarterback debate. Mm-hmm. And as you said, you know, the reason why it's still a debate is because Mike Zimmer hasn't came out and said anything. Now, Tony Dungy on Football Night in America, I tweeted this out, um, yeah. talked about how it's Mike Zimmer's kind of – it's his job at this point to name a starter and, you know, end the quarterback circus in Minnesota in so many words. Um, I had a nice conversation with Matt Collar on Twitter. He responded to that about saying how he doesn't necessarily believe that Mike Zimmer is, you know, dragging either quarterback along or stringing them along, if you will. Um, he's actually, you know, had a conversation. He thinks that, in theory, he probably had a conversation with these guys, and they know the situation, and they have an understanding of that. So maybe that's why we've seen, I guess, very humble responses uh, from both quarterbacks in this situation, a difficult situation for these guys. Um, I'm, I, you know what? an elite situation for the Vikings, just a difficult personal situation for these two quarterbacks. Right. Uh, and to some degree, you know, I, you know, first of all, he's a reporter at a higher level than I am, so I'm not going to deny, you know, his thinking here. And second of all, um, I, I get that. That makes sense. But here's what it comes down for, com, comes down to for me, and this is why I think that Zimmer needs to come out and name Keenan the starter. And this, again, this is coming from a guy that believes that Teddy Bridgewater should ultimately get the, you know, a chance to start. But – in respect to Case Keenum at this point, you know, if you you know, in theory, a guy plays better when he has job security. You know, when you when you you know, when you're at work and you're scared of getting fired or losing your position or whatever that is, um, I'm you know, I haven't personally been in that situation at this point in my life, thank God. But I'm sure there's a lot of people that can resonate with this. You probably don't perform at nearly as high of a level. Um, when, you know, I remember back in college when I was, you know, studying for an exam that I knew that I was going to fail, um, or that I was going to get, you know, a terrible grade on. Right. Um, you just, 
you're flustered. You're just not the same person. So if you want this quarterback situation to be resolved so we can truly evaluate this Vikings team, you know, moving forward, someone needs to be named the starter. And right now, it's hard to name anyone other than Case Keenan, that guy, especially, you know, with a short week heading into Detroit. Um, you know, we talked about that on the last episode. That's a factor here. Yeah. Um, but, you know, at, at the end of the day, do, I know that it's a cutthroat league. I know that it's an unfair league. I know that, you know, the players are compensated highly. Guys, I know all the things that you're going to say to me in response to this. I'm well aware. Like, you're not teaching me new facts when you respond to me like this. I'm talking from a human perspective. I think Case Keenum has earned the right to be this team's starter. It seems like everyone's on board with it from Jarius Wright, Kyle Rudolph, Stefan Diggs, Adam Thielen. All of these guys have spoken extremely, extremely highly of Case Keenum and might actually be, like, not happy about him losing his job at this point just because of how well, you know, at least they are saying he's playing behind closed – you know, I don't know. We, we don't necessarily know what's going on behind closed doors, but you know what I'm saying. It, it, it just seems like, out of respect to Case Keenum, Yes, he makes two million a year. Yes, he's going to be fine if you know they you know don't name a starter for their, the rest of the season even. But just out of human respect, decency for the guy here, he's proven himself, has he not? It's like well, you're... see, I I I see another side of this. I see that there's we need to acknowledge the possibility that you know maybe Teddy Bridgewater's presence behind him is actually pushing Case Keenum to perform better or There's to that, yeah. you know maybe take that those extra shots down the field that sometimes tend to pan out uh, i think he took actually quite a few today against the rams that they didn't really pan out i don't remember i think that one to Thielen in the end zone um, arguably could have been pi but at the end of the day you know he's taking the shots down the field giving guys a chance and it's been working in the past and you know maybe if he does get the job officially and Maybe he's more conservative, and it changes his style of play, and things go haywire there. So there's, I think that's the other side that I'm looking at here. Um, and the way I see Mike Zimmer looking at this is I think he really wants Teddy Bridgewater to be the quarterback. I do, too. Um, see, that's what I think it comes down to, too. And then at the same time, like, uh, that, I think, that I think raises he's waiting. The- I think he's waiting for a convenient time to make the change. But there that's, isn't going to be one. That's, that's my problem. I think that, he's waiting for the justifiable time to make it, and that's why he hasn't officially named Keenum that's, Keenum that's my That's my problem right there. That's my problem. I don't believe there's going to be a justifiable time because at this point, Keenum has now played well, you know, for sure in two games. He has, you know, been a part – of or led the team to six consecutive victories, even if he loses against Detroit, which is a monster matchup. Don't get me wrong. But if he loses against Detroit, let's say he throws three picks, there are still going to be people who are going to be pissed. You're not going to please everyone here. If you make the switch after Detroit on a, quote, long week, you know, an extended buy, as, you know, some people like to call it, um, you're you're still going to piss off people. You're like Mike Zimmer, like, you're this hard-nosed dude. Sack up and make a call. Like you, you have to do it because I don't believe that there is a time that he's gonna like have reasonable justification for pulling Keenum at this point. I mean, you've played ten games. You've got six left here. Keenum basically needs to play poorly in three consecutive games to really warrant a switch at this point. I yeah. mean, I mean, I, I get, I get what you're saying. I'm just like my my point being here is like it, there if I understand what Zimmer is waiting for I just don't think it's coming so why not get your team set to but make maybe okay super- maybe maybe he's maybe maybe Zimmer has a time frame in which he he's kind of giving himself that you know that time for that just justifiable moment to happen that okay I have x many games or x many weeks for Case Keenum to quote-unquote screw up which is probably a really bad way of doing this but that's what I, I think, think I too. I think he's really set on Teddy Bridgewater being the t- this team's quarterback, and I, yeah. um, just by this is just by reading what he says in press conferences, the way he answers things, and he, the fact that he hasn't committed yet's pretty. I mean, on a six-game winning streak, and your offense is still at this point a top five, top ten in the unit in the league, and in, ex- in terms of explosive plays, I believe they're top five. Um, at some point, you got to, you have to cave and be like, all right, this guy's our starter. I mean, look what he's doing, and there's absolutely there's not really any weakness at all with Keenum. Um, it's just, you know, I think he really thinks Teddy Bridgewater with this unit could be even better than Keenum. And I think that's, he's waiting for a moment that's convenient, um, for him and for the team to make that switch, which it's really unfair to Case Keenum because if he has one mega game or 
I mean, what have you. If he plays, for example, if he plays this week on Thanksgiving against Detroit the same way he did week four, I really think that Teddy Bridgewater will start the following game just Does because he, of the way he, Zimmer's reaction. Would you think that he'd get the hook in the middle of the game? Not in the middle of the game, no. But, yeah. I mean, it would be, you know, they get the long week, the long break, um, and I think I think they'd make the change then if Keenum is a repeat of, you know, the way he played against Detroit in week four. Hey, you know, I want to say this again. My, my, like, quote, my tune hasn't necessarily changed here. I'm still a huge proponent of Teddy Bridgewater getting into the game. Um, I just don't like this unknown when you can resolve it. That's, that's like, that is the greater issue here in my mind, is that you have this unknown here where, I mean, even, you know, uh, Rodney Harrison was talking about the Vikings versus the Eagles right now. Is who is the, you know, who is the NFC power with the Saints involved as well here with the Rams going down this week to the Vikings? And his reasoning behind why he chose the Eagles was because the Vikings have a questionable quarterback situation. That's a reasonable concern, in my opinion. Like, if you don't know... See, I would go- be I would be more concerned if if this it, if it posed a locker room problem. And I really don't think that that's the case with this team, no pun intended. Um, I really think that the team is behind both guys equally, and it's not like they will... And I, I really think, too, the way the scheme is set up, the way the protection... How you know, solid the protection has been, the running game. Yeah. I really don't think... I I really don't see a drastic drop off or improvement either way. If Teddy's in there, I just think the ceiling is a bit higher. But right. again, the I'm risk with is that you disrupt the rhythm that they've built with Case Keenum. This offense is already top five in explosive plays, yeah. and then you know, et cetera. I mean, they put up 450 yards against a top five defense today. Yeah. So I don't I mean I, I I see both sides, and I really today's kind of. You know, prior to this game, I was okay. Let's get Teddy in there as soon as possible. Right. Why not take that chance? Because he's probably the higher ceiling, and this is all about winning a Super Bowl. But man, he he Case Keenum hung in there tough today, and he he really. I think there was just one really dumb decision that I was like, "What are you doing, man?" But it yeah. actually was that it was that completion he threw to Adam Thielen when he had like five guys on top the of magician, him. Magician, yeah. Yeah, I was. I was like, I, when he threw that ball, I was like, man, what are you doing? And then it was a completion. So I, 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 I can't really defend my that stance anymore. I just kind of, I have to just be okay with either one. You know, I'm right in the middle. I, I'm gonna be that guy that's right in the fence because I, I really see the positives to both. That I mean, and that's not a bad stance to have. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm with you there to a degree. Um, I just think that at the end of the day, if this really is the most important position in football which on the Vikings you know I've, I've said this a couple times I don't think the quarterback position is actually the most important position on this particular team it's not. but I just think it I, I, I just think it's important to get your ducks in a row uh, now that you've you know you got you're, you're entering the home stretch stretch pretty soon here uh, I think it's very important to you know if you are going to, to switch to Teddy Bridgewater you know, we've we've been saying this for the last couple of shows. Right. He he, he, need, he needs time to knock the rust off before the postseason. And you know, he's not going to play. He's de- I mean, I bet my life that he's not going to play next week. Um, so when's the good time? I don't think there is one. Uh, yeah. So I, I think, think the only realistic time would be if Keenum does falter against Detroit, and they have that long break, and they can yeah. you know pair themselves for the switch and then have him play. I believe that would be Atlanta the next week. Yeah. So. I think that would be the only realistic time this could work. Otherwise, I don't, I don't see really it happening. I don't see any reason for them to to, to go from um, Keenum, especially if again if they win on Thanksgiving. Um, I, I don't see any reason that the coaching staff would do that. But um, right, it's just I don't know, man. I really think Zimmer Zimmer wants to find some way, some reason to put Teddy in there and at least see what he has. Um, he wants again, to do that, but he also wants to keep winning. You know. Right. That, and oh, that, yeah. that's what Absolutely. creates this. Yeah. Hey, I, I, you know, just to round out this, we need this... to make sure we need to make sure we're not painting this picture of like Mike Zimmer as like this guy that's like you know okay with losing as long as right. Teddy gets this I, so That's not at all what we're trying to say here. It's just right. it's, you can just tell the way he speaks in the press conferences about Teddy and Case that he loves both of them for sure, but he just really wants to see what Teddy can do with this unit. I think, and you can't blame him, right? I, I don't blame him for that. Um, I still think that Teddy Bridgewater would probably be the superior quarterback, but I am buying into, you know, the case Keenum, um, how, what he can provide at this point. I think he can probably beat anyone if this defense is playing as well as it is. Um, Adam Thielen, Stephon Diggs keep doing their thing. Running game keep, continues. Uh, you know, I think I am a believer in this team as a dark color Super Bowl contending team with Case Keenum at the helm now where I 
it wasn't probably two weeks ago. These have been very important games well, in that regard. One more question before we move on from the Keenum, the quarterback thing. Um, pro football talk, I think Mike Florio tweeted something today about how Keenum has emerged as a dark horse MVP candidate. Mm-hmm. I want to know what your take is on this because I, I saw this and at first I was like, are you kidding me? Like really Case Keenum? But I thought about it and I thought, well, he's definitely the most valuable backup in the league and he's been thrust into action and this team is eight and two owning a number two seed in the NFC. This offense is a top five unit in the league right now, arguably, if, if not top 10, you can't just shade any credit there to everybody else besides the quarterback. The quarterback deserves some credit for that. And I, th- I think in that, because of that, I think Keenum deserves at least partial consideration for MVP, which sounds absurd to, to hear probably for listeners right now. But I mean, I would put him in the you know five to ten range of MVP candidates. But I think, I mean, obviously Brady, Wentz, and Breeze are probably in their own class, and everybody else just kind of chasing them. But I would say, I don't think it's absurd to think of Keenum as a, at least getting some consideration for MVP. And honestly, that just makes the conversation we just had that much more ridiculous, right? We're talking about whether an MVP candidate should be the starter of this team moving forward. Which and that, I, I still think, I still think it it would it would to, uh, in some way behoove the Vikings to make I, the change. And I'm see not. Yeah, it's so that's why this is so weird. I, you have, this you have is a dumb M- situation. There is have, this is a dumb situation. There isn't like like you and I can sit here and talk all night about Case Keenum and Teddy Bridgewater, and we're not going to please everybody. I'm cool with that. You're cool with that. We've made our peace with that. But the point is here is what you got to understand is that. We don't know the right answer either. We're just trying to take all the objective evidence at hand here and try to come up with the best scenario. And from a human, like from a humanity standpoint, I think you name Case Keenan the starter. But then you also, if you if you recognize that this is a cutthroat league, you don't care about the humanity standpoint. That's fine with me too. I'm cool with that take. Um, and then you think, you know, Teddy Bridgewater has a lot to offer. There's a lot of potential there to see a higher ceiling. How high is the floor for Case Keenan? I mean, there's so many different things to measure here that you can't come out yeah. with. If you're if you're still like if your opinion on this hasn't swayed at all with the way Keenum has played last two weeks, then you're not watching the game correctly, and you're you had these Teddy colored shades on, and they're too strong, and you're not seeing clearly, uh, really what Keenum is doing. I think on the field, so that's I guess I mean we've talked about this for too long. I think when there's other guys that deserve a lot of credit as well for this win, but it's it's something it's again it's a storyline that's going to have to be looked at the rest of well the rest of the season as long as Mike Zimmer doesn't name an official starter right and so that's the big question now is if when uh how what's going to have to happen will it happen um is Mike Zimmer going to do this i mean he's been coy about this right last yeah. week someone asked him you know after the Washington game asked him like you know you said that Teddy Bridgewater is going to play at some point. How do you feel about that now? Well, following the four touchdown performance last week, and he was his response was, "Well, things change." Yeah, he said I, something about he has a plan and things change, and yeah, I mean, I'm sure plans change, did, and yeah. that and that's you know that's how the NFL works. It's a 16 game season for a reason. You have to make swift decisions, and that's 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 the boiling point for me right here. 16 game seasons, you need to make swift, decisive decisions, even if it pisses people off. That's why I think you got to name a quarterback. Now, I don't really care who it is, to be quite honest with you. I believe in both of these guys at this point. So that is the end of that talker. Uh, but we're going to you know, Good. kind of mosey right over into another debate here because I think this is also something that came out of this game and something I pulled uh, my personal Twitter audience on and got their opinion on. Um, and that is, who is the Vikings' number one receiver right now? Now, the obvious question here is, does this matter? No, no, it doesn't matter at all. Zero uh, percent. Uh, I don't care who's number one, number two, number three, number eight, whatever. Doesn't matter. Is it a fun talker? Absolutely. So who is the number one receiver on this team? Adam Thielen comes up with another big performance over 100 yards, a huge touchdown, a you know a nail in the coffin touchdown. Stephon Diggs had a couple chain movers today, a relatively quiet performance relative to his standards, what we expect from him, I suppose. Uh, but overall, these two guys have you know solid bodies of work. Um, Thielen is in, you know, definitely in the conversation right now as an elite receiver. Stephon Diggs is kind of on the cusp of stardom with the health sort of holding him back and some other little things holding him back. Uh, I think that the answer here is relatively obvious, you know, at least right now. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I know your answer to this, but who is the Vikings number one receiver right now? Yeah, we got this question too from, and I'm going to say this name, Anton Kashkarev, Kashkarev, maybe that's wrong. I don't know. 
but simply asking, you know, Thielen or Diggs, who's the better receiver. And um, right now I think it's really impossible to pick against Adam Thielen. Right. Uh, I think, and again, this is not supposed to be anything against the They're, they're both phenomenal players. They both are technicians on right. running routes. They're both phenomenal athletes. I mean, we saw Thielen straightaway speed in the game today where he, all he all it took was a little eight yard stop route or something like that. And he turned it into a touchdown. Uh, it's, they're both, the Vikings are very blessed to have both of them. I'm right. going to say that I'll, I'll take Thielen right now, just because the production has been more consistent this season and he's on the field more often. So right. from that aspect, I'm taking Thielen. but again, it's not like Diggs is, you know, not a good receiver or not. I mean, as talented as Thielen, it's just, I don't know. The thielen has been more productive and more reliable. Right. That's really the only answer here. And, that, and that's, uh, that's my reason too, is the reason why I answer this question with Adam Thielen um, is simply because he has been more productive on the field and he has been more reliable. He's been healthy. Um, he does all kinds of different stuff. He's worked his way to get to this point. Not to say that Stephon Diggs hasn't, uh, but he certainly earned his opportunity and made the most of it. Um, that's something that we still need to see from Stephon Diggs to a degree. Uh, with Diggs, it's a consistency and a health thing. With Adam Thielen, uh, those concerns have been alleviated and he's right. basically playing on uh, you know, a bogus contract at this point, you know, from his perspective, he's probably looking at that deal and being like, oh, dude, yeah. I probably should have waited a little bit longer because uh, he could make yeah. a hell of a lot more money. But at the end of the day here, you know, you can make an argument the Vikings have two number one receivers because both of them have oh, yeah. played that oh, role yeah. um, at multiple points in the year. Which I, we should we should give credit to the Vikings coaching staff for making the switch between, you know, Diggs being the slot guy last year, Thielen outside to vice versa this year. Yeah. Uh, I think both guys are more comfortable and more successful uh, and, uh, you know, feeling with the slot roll right now and Diggs kind of on the outside. Yeah, Pat Shermer's done a tremendous job. Uh, he actually called a brilliant game once again today. There was two or three different calls that Pat Shermer made today where I was like, man, that's some that's some high-level stuff. That's some, that's some you know, you're playing – he's playing chess while Wade Phillips was playing checkers today. So uh, I was very impressed with what he was able to do and what he's been able to do um, with these Vikings receivers. Um, like I said before, I think you can make a, a strong argument for both of them here. But, you know, if you're reactionary, um, which at this point, uh, you know, you're 10 games into the year, you have a s large sample size, I think it's hard to go with anyone other than Adam Thielen. Um, for the results of our poll, the poll that I did on Twitter, um, when I last checked it, uh, it was at about 215 votes and 84% of you guys um, were on board with Adam Thielen, which uh, I can't disagree with you guys at this point. I will say, though, that I still think that if Diggs can put together a 16-game season, I think his ceiling is probably higher than sure. Thielen's. Uh, but at this point, I don't really care whose ceiling is higher just because both of these guys are playing so well. And I think that you saw when the Vikings were running, trotting out just one receiver, uh, when they were running you know, two tight ends and two running backs, for example, um, they did that a couple different times today. We saw Adam Thielen on the field as the number one guy, quote. Again, none of this matters whatsoever. Just a fun talker. And, uh, yeah, like you said, the Vikings are blessed to have both of these receivers. Um, so before we get into the Twitter takes, let's talk about this defense a little bit here. Uh, we should have probably spent a lot more time on this show talking about the defense because this was a, yeah. an unbelievable effort. Holding the number one offense, an offense that's averaging over 35 points per game, I believe, uh, Two under 10 points, seven points. That opening drive is the only points they got all game long. You know, the Vikings could not have started that game worse, and yet they responded um, extremely well. Um, as you and I talked before here, uh, the script uh, that Sean McVay trotted out worked extremely well yeah. on the opening drive, and Mike Zimmer made some fantastic adjustments. You know, I have to review the film to try to see to see if I can even pinpoint these adjustments because I didn't notice in real time uh, whatsoever, but. Uh, he did something there, uh, and it was a huge difference maker. So, um, you saw, you know, a couple of big, you know, a couple of big plays throughout the game. I think that you probably have to give the game ball, though, on d at least defensively speaking, um, to your guy Anthony Harris, who came up with yeah. a phenomenal performance. Uh, There's a couple of times where he had his weight thrown around today. I thought, which that's kind of par for the yeah. course for Anthony Harris. You're going to get that, but he also came up with maybe the biggest turnover of the season. Uh, stopping Cooper Cup at the goal line and forcing that ball out and then actually recovering it himself. Phenomenal play right there. Um, and he also made a couple of big tackles throughout the game. Uh, Vikings, you know, may, they win the turnover battle on that particular play. And as we talked about on the pregame show, it might just take one turnover 
in the, yeah. the first or second quarter uh, to decide this game. And ultimately, you know, if they score there, it's a different ball game because Kai oh, Forrester for sure. just missed two field goals. The Rams would be, you know, moving, um, heading into the half with a lead. Uh, it's a different game. So Anthony Harris, I think, is probably defensive MVP for the for today. Steps up for Andrew Sandejo uh, in his absence and really threw a lights out performance out there. Yeah, I mean, it's it's. I think it's funny how we all week we kind of talked about at least on the Friday, uh, excuse me, the Friday podcast and the pregame show we talked about the loss of Andrew Sandejo and how big that was and right. how well he played against Washington. Anthony Harris comes in here. And, you know, I think according to Pro Football Focus here, he was targeted four times, allowed just two catches for 20 yards. Um, he had a pass uh, pass breakup. He had, yep. obviously, the big fumble, um, you know, fumble force at the one-yard line, preventing a touchdown. And he also, I think, if he had a, actually, a, I remember one specific run stop he had where he um, shoves Cooper Cup backwards probably three yards in the backfield and forced Todd Gurley to change direction and, and right. ended up with a loss of a couple yards. So, I mean, he was – he was excellent today. You can't say enough about Anthony Harris. Um, I think he kind of ignited that, you know, that fumble he forced at the one yard line and recover it was kind of, it ignited the defense a little bit and it, um, you know, it definitely turned momentum of the game. And I think from there, I believe the, uh, the Vikings, did they scored 24 unanswered where they already, were yeah. they already down seven yeah. zero. Yeah. yeah. So they scored 24 unanswered after that. Uh, you have to give a lot of credit to Harris and the way he played today. Absolutely. So Anthony Harris definitely sticks out like a sore thumb today. Um, a guy that didn't stick out like a sore thumb, uh, which was kind of funny, uh, just because it typically means that he played really well with Xavier Rhodes, who was in and out of the game, obviously, with that um, with that injury that, you know, I saw him, he was in the medical tent, we saw Mackenzie Alexander on the outside for a while, who actually had a pretty solid performance as well, uh, but Xavier Rhodes continues lockdown play, uh, Trey Waynes looked pretty good once again. Like I said, Mackenzie Alexander looked very good to me. Um, the linebackers flowing sideline to sideline, closing gaps for Todd Gurley. I believe he had under 40 rushing yards today yeah. um, and under 20 receiving yards too. So those, that screen game did not work at all for Sean McVay. That's probably one of the primary yeah. adjustments. I think, that, I think they had two of those in that first drive, and after that it was just yeah. – completely shut down right so you know you look at you know when i go back and look at the film here i feel like that'll be something that you know as an in, in terms of an adjustment that zimmer yep. made um he was doing something to blow up those screens and not letting him have them uh sammy watkins was another player who started out i think he made the very first catch of the game and we didn't see him at all after that like the very first throw of the game i think he had like an eight yard comeback on xavier Rhodes. yeah he and did. then after that he was he was gone and robert woods was basically yep, he finished a with three catches Okay, yeah, so, so, you know, it was – this was a lights-out performance across the board. A um, couple big sacks. Neil Hunter uh, literally went straight through Rob Havenstein to get a sack today. That was great to see. Um, nice to see him getting to the quarterback with more regularity um, at, towards the, I guess, the middle section of the season here. Everson Griffin's sack streak is officially over now. Um, missed last week, obviously, so if you wanted to end the streak there, you could, but – um, I tend to treat these things like hitting streaks in baseball. Um, he didn't play last week, so the streak is over now. Uh, doesn't necessarily matter, but if you're someone Tayshaun that likes... Tayshaun Bauer's sack streak is longer than Everson Griffin's right now. Yeah, how about that? Tayshaun Bauer, credit to um, our listeners here on the uh, on the Bout the Labor pregame show this morning. Um, we talked a little bit about Tayshaun Bauer and how we didn't expect him to get too many snaps, especially with Stephen Weatherly being active. Um you know, it was to be, we, fair, to be fair, it was a complete garbage time sack. I sure, mean, yeah, sure. All the Vikings backups were in, but hey, I mean, hey, I, that's a fine. Sack. I I don't care just because this isn't the preseason anymore. It's not like he was playing against, you know, pedestrian. He was still playing against the Rams starters, so I guess you may have to give him that. You, you take what you will from it, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, you could look at this and be like, Tayshawn Bauer might be the greatest player of all time because he's got an infinity sack streak going right now. <laughs> that's how you could look at it. You could do that. Um, but probably don't. But the point being here is the Vikings defense was electric once again today, top to bottom. Uh, you saw the depth show up once again in Anthony Harris in a big way. Um, linebackers are solid. Seems like these cornerbacks are getting somehow stronger throughout the year. Uh, I mean, you can't say enough about Waynes and Alexander stepping up in a big way today, especially with Rhodes being in and out of the lineup. Um, Harrison Smith did his thing again. I mean, what – I run out of things to say with this defense because it's so, a lot of it is just kind of like an expectation at this point. You know what I'm saying? Like when the Vikings allowed what they allowed last week against Kirk Cousins and Co. That was yeah. weird. This was normal this week. Like this is my, which is, is absurd. Yeah, I mean the Rams were averaging 32 points a game coming in. Yeah. They get seven on their first drive, and then they go the rest of the game without scoring. And I think 
you know, the one thing I noticed uh, throughout the game was pre-snap, the Vikings were moving around a lot, mm-hmm. especially the safeties. Uh, you saw Anthony Harris creep up and then back off. You saw Harrison Smith do the same thing, or he they would simply shift into from a deep, you know, single safety look to a cover two look. Uh, you, he had guys moving all around all over the place. And, I mean, again, that's just Mike Zimmer making his in-game adjustments and making Jared Goff confused at the line of scrimmage and generally taking away that first read, which forced him to kind of, you know, uh, improvise a little bit. And, uh, you know, it, it made Goff's job way tougher than it has been all season long, for sure. And, you know, obviously, I, I thought Goff played actually okay considering the circumstances today. Uh, he just, you know, it, it, he was more uncomfortable than he's been than in a long time. And that's obviously credit to Zimmer and uh, his schemes, his adjustments, and obviously the Vikings, um, you know, the, the players on the field for uh, executing the game plan. So it's Mike Zimmer goes down as the um, initial victor of what might be um, kind of somewhat of an NFC rivalry uh, moving forward here if these teams continue to be, um, you know, powerhouses, I suppose, uh, in the NFC for the foreseeable future here. Um, the old man gets his W over the young man today. Mm. Uh, I believe Zimmer is actually double the double in age to Sean McVay. He's so, got to be. Yeah, gotta something be. like that. So uh, that's definitely nice to see. Uh, let's jump into the Twitter takes here and wrap this thing up. Uh, what do we yeah. got here today? Yeah, um, uh, we'll, we'll kind of first talk about the NFC, I guess, landscape now that, um, I mean, we have, I believe all, well, C- Seattle and Atlanta play tomorrow night uh, or Monday night, but um you know, we got a couple questions about the Eagles and you know the home field advantage stuff. So both from Eli uh, at school season and Chase Albertson at Albertson Chase, um, they asked us about you know comparing the Vikings to the Eagles right now and the chances of you know earning the number one seed in the NFC and having home field for literally all of the playoffs. So uh, what do you think about those uh, questions? Yeah, I mean at this point, you know, I said it earlier in the show. I think the Vikings are a very realistic Super Bowl contender right now. Um, that essentially means that I believe the Vikings can go straight to the Super Bowl, which means going through teams like Los Angeles again, Philadelphia potentially, New Orleans again. Uh, I mean, the Vikings have beaten now New Orleans and Los Angeles. Those are the only; those are two of the other three teams with eight wins right now, or excuse me, uh, seven wins right now. So in the NFC at least. So. I think, yes, the Vikings can absolutely contend with Philadelphia. Obviously, they threw up uh, quite the second half on Dallas tonight, uh, which you know may raise some concerns moving forward here. But at the end of the day, I think that you know the quarterback position is what's going to be the difference here in, in that type of a matchup. So I would like to see the Vikings, you know, answer that question before we really get into talking about how the Vikings square up uh, with Philadelphia. But the short, the short thing here is basically that, yeah, I think the Vikings are good enough to beat anyone. And that includes Philadelphia at this point. Yeah. uh, I mean, I I do think the Vikings are good enough to beat Philadelphia. I do question. I do have some concerns about going to Philadelphia and doing it. Sure. Uh, Sure. I obviously, I think, I think if the game's at us bank stadium, I I'd like the Vikings that game. If it's on the road, I probably pick Philadelphia uh, in a hypothetical right. NFC championship per se. Um, I will say that you know, given the Philadelphia schedule here, they have, I think it's relatively easy, except for a two-week stretch, kind of where the Vikings are actually dealing with here, uh, uh-huh. where they have at Seattle and then at the Rams in consecutive weeks. Uh-huh. And if they can get through that with, you know, if they can split those games. Uh, I, the Vikings, the Eagles will be set up pretty well because then they have Giants, Raiders, Cowboys to finish the season. Mm-hmm. Um, rel- three relatively winnable games. So they're looking, I mean, 13 wins is probably really realistic for this Eagles team. Is 13 uh, the, wins realistic for this Vikings team though? It's, it's realistic. Right. I don't, I'm, I, I don't, I wouldn't bet. I'm betting on 12 right now is what I would just by yeah. looking at it. I would say of the next three probably win one if not two and then those last three games with the Bengals, packers and bears. uh bears. bears i mean if aaron Rodgers is back for that packers game that could be interesting but otherwise you know i like the vikings to win at 12 at this point and i think the eagles looking at their schedule i think they're probably good for 13 so i would put the vikings behind philadelphia and you know as far as home field advantage goes but i do think you know looking at the rosters looking at the production this season looking at their uh the results and whatnot i do like um I, I, I really do think the Vikings match up with them in a way that could win. I just think the location of the game would be the difference. Sure. I, I'm fine with that, too. 
All right. Uh, next one here we have from Ben Anderson, NFL. He asks us a couple things. Um, basically, you know, he's talked about C.J. Ham, uh, how he went from, you know, this kind of guy that we all – we all really liked the practice squad running back that performed well in preseason to, you know, in one off season, a very reliable uh, NFL fullback. Um, so, I mean, you can t- kind of just go off and talk about that. And then obviously, and then next he says, Jerick McKinnon's um, status for the roster next season. Uh, is he, do you think he'll be brought back? Uh, what kind of deal maybe we're looking at? Uh, what do you think about those two things? Oh, okay. Well, let's start with CJ Hamm because I, I want to reiterate this, something that we said way back in, July. This is one of like the, like the nicest people of all time. Yeah. So I love seeing CJ Ham play well. Uh, for me, I, I mean, I have loved this dude basically since I had the opportunity to interact with him two years ago. Uh, and then you know, seeing the rise, the change from running back to fullback has been awesome. Um, it, it, it's it's a it's 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 like Adam Thielen's story, but like the knockoff version um, because he's not doing everything he's not but, a receiver but he's you know he's a non-division one prospect that came out worked really really hard did everything he was asked to do learned the playbook learned how to be an effective fullback um you know we talked about you know during the preseason when we spoke with or right before the preseason at training camp when we spoke with him how he was watching greg jones on film on yeah. um, the old fullback from jacksonville so he has done a ton of work to get to where he is now, and you know, I'm I'm thrilled for him, and I'm lo- I love that he has his own official GIF on Twitter too. That everyone always uses the yeah, th- yeah that yeah. sassy lady saying ham like that's that needs to pop up every time he touches the ball. I love it, man. It's a great story. Um, it j- but unfortunately on this Vikings team, it's like the third greatest story this year. So you probably don't yeah, hear sure. um you don't even hear that much about it. But you know, I love CJ Ham. I'm, I'm glad I'm, I'm I love his type of his, the, t- the production that he has brought to the table so far. Um, as for Jarek and Ken, I think that really this question should be more about Latavius Murray right now, I think. Because um, mature Murray, if you guys remember, the way his contract is set up, the Vikings can get out from underneath it after just one year. Now, McKinnon could hypothetically walk as well. We know that Delvin Cook is going to be the running back of the future, barring something ridiculous here with his ACL yeah. um, rehab, I suppose, um, which, you know, for what it's worth, we've seen – crazier things especially with Sharif Floyd um, reportedly having his career over now Uh, so you in theory my heading into next year ton of you know tons of time left obviously but I think that right now you look at the depth chart it stacks up Dalvin Cook Jarek McKinnon Latavius Murray are your three running backs and then CJ Hamm is your fullback obviously Um, we know that the Vikings are cool with keeping three running backs in a fullback now because they obviously just did it um, you know a couple months ago so I think that it's plausible that both Murray and McKinnon are back, but I think one of them is going to go, and I think it's more likely that it's Murray uh, just because I think that the Vikings can still, despite his production this year, can still get McKinnon for a relatively cheap amount of money. We've seen LeGarrette Blunt, for example, has cr- been criminally underpaid in a much greater role um, throughout his career. So I think you'll probably see a similar contract to what he's been getting, despite being very different sure. players. Sure. Um, and that for me means that McKinnon is probably here to stay. Yeah. I, I, I tend to think Murray's chances of staying are higher. Um, just really? because I believe, I, I think, I think McKinnon will have a little bit more freedom and I think he'll have the opportunity to get paid more elsewhere. But, um, I mean, either way, I think you're going to have a really reliable guy behind Dalvin Cook next year, and you'll you'll still have kind of that one-two punch. Um, right. You regard well whether it's Murray or McKinnon kind of joining Cook there. So, uh, but you know, regarding C.J. Ham, I mean, when I, I talked to him at training camp this year, and he talked a lot about you know that adjustment. Obviously, I asked him with you know moving to, from running back to fullback, and he said you know he he couldn't say enough about Kennedy Kennedy Palomalu, running back coach. Um, sure. You know, showing him how to play the fullback position and that, you know, the technique behind blocking. It's not just smacking somebody as hard as you can. That, you know, it's it's essentially you're playing, you're you're kind of playing a, the pulling guard role in right. the offense, right? Where you're you have you're supposed to move around and block guys as if you're a lineman, and so adjusting to that. And again, he mentioned watching Greg Jones' film. Um, it, it's really remarkable what he's done because he's taking. He's his entire life. He's been playing running back, carrying the football. Mm-hmm. Now he's doing it a completely different position, and he's doing it at, at the highest level possible uh, for a team that's eight and two, and you know one of the top teams in the league. So uh, you can't say enough about that. And he's just another example of uh, you know 
one of those feel good stories that uh, you know if he ever makes it big in the NFL as a running back, maybe is he'll he'll get the same treatment Thielen does with the you know Augustana D two from South Dakota from yep. Minnesota or from Duluth, Minnesota. That whole hard thing. work, so, determination, gr- gritty. Would yeah. they use? Would they use grit though? Because he is. They probably wouldn't. They wouldn't. He use isn't gritty. white. Yeah, they no. probably. W- they would say. Uh, they wouldn't say that he's a smart player. Or they would. What's the? What's the? Is he's not sneaky fast. Um, he's not a smart player. What is? What? What are the terms that they use for? Um, God damn, I can't think. Uh, anyways. Point being here is that, um, yes, I think you're right, is that the story is very similar to Adam Thielen. It's just that he's playing fullback, not a superstar receiver. But props to him for everything that he's done and all the success that he has had this year. Um, He's certainly earned it. Yeah, our last question here from Vincent Levine. He's asking us, uh, if the Vikings are hitting their peak too early, are you worried about this? Um, See, this is a phenomenon that I don't really buy into. Um, I know a lot of people do. I'm not a very superstitious person, just in general. Like I, you're a little stitious. I'm a little stitious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, is it possible? Yeah. Uh, do I think that? Again, I just don't really buy. I don't buy into peaking early ever. I just think good teams play well in big situations. That's kind of what I think. So. I don't think that teams really burn out ever. Like, I don't think yeah. that they just, like, start being yeah. good and burn. 2016 Vikings would. But did they burn out or did they suck? Both. Because they kind of suck. <laughs> did they suck? <laughs> I mean, that, that's kind of what it comes down to for me is I just don't really think that teams burn out if they're actually good. They lose games because they either – something changes. Injuries. Uh, people figure them out. They get – they. You know, they hand out the blueprint, which is something that I brought up yeah. after the Cleveland game where I was a little bit concerned about that. That hasn't been an issue just yet. Um, so, no, I no, I, I, honestly, no, I'm not concerned about them peaking too early. I think that I think this team is good enough to have this be the bar, to be quite honest with you. See, I don't think this team is – I think this Vikings team has been relatively the same all season long. Yeah. Uh, and, I, I mean, that Steelers game, I the whole quarterback situation all week, we don't really know how that all went down if – if Keenan was expected to start, if, you know, whatever it was. Uh, but gr- regardless, we know that the chemistry was definitely not there with him in the offensive line, Absolutely. with him in the receivers, et cetera. Um, the Lions game, I think the loss of Dalvin Cook was huge in that game, a large part of why the Vikings didn't win that game. Um, and again, the offensive chemistry was still being built with Case Keenum and company. Yeah. Um, I think the defense has been, I mean, it's not really more, it's not peaking because we saw last week against Washington, things didn't go perfectly. Um, so I, I, this, this idea that they're peaking, I don't think that's accurate. I think they're just, they're, they're playing good football. They're, they've been playing good football all season long. Um, and I think, I mean, I, I don't, I don't, I really don't think peaking is the issue. I think they're just this good. They, they win games. Um, and you know, we, they won comfortably against teams that weren't that great before the bye week. They kind of, I mean, and they're still winning games comfortably against better teams now after the bye week and you get another test the next few weeks here and if they keep winning comfortably i think we just have to you know identify the fact that the vikings are a good team they're not just peaking they're just that's who they are they're beating good teams here let me give you let me give you some you know objective reasoning to suggest that the vikings aren't a quote roller coaster team a peak team if you will um one of the reasons why i think the vikings are possibly peak proof um, is because of the depth right with green bay they can hypothetically peak when Aaron Rodgers is playing his best, but when he's not playing well, they're susceptible sure. to a low floor. Or in this case, if he's not on the field at all, they're susceptible to scoring zero points. So I don't think the Vikings are can be that manipulated by a huge injury, right? Like even if Harris well, Smith can, we've went seen down, it already. They, right. they lost Sam Bradford and right. Delvin Cook right. and but, Stephon Diggs for a period, so, and they're still it, a top 5'10 offense. Right, but if you're right a believer there. that the defense is the engine of this team, which I know you are, uh, it probably takes a major inv- injury on the defensive side of the ball to potentially shake this thing up. But who, I mean, like, who needs to go down for it to, like, to kill the entire defense? Maybe Xavier Rhodes, possibly. But we've seen the cornerback step up. Maybe Harrison Smith. You've seen Anthony, Anthony Harris, Harris, Harris step, step up. up. Yeah. I mean, the defensive tackle position, we haven't even seen Jaleel Johnson yet. We forgot about him. 
If Linville Joseph goes down, I mean, can the Vikings handle that one? That one might be it. That might be the biggest like thing. Him or Anthony Barr. Because the the what's I think it, it's Linville. It's either Linville or Anthony Barr. Because it's Emmanuel Lemur or Jaleel Johnson that gets thrown into the fold there. Um I mean, regardless, the depth is there. The po- to that's where, that's you know, the point here is that you don't. I don't think there is one player that if you lose that player that you see a significant, like just a massive drop off, enough to really kill this team from quote peaking right now. So, uh, you know, I guess you can turn this into a hashtag. I think the Vikings are hashtag peak, they're peak proof, seriously, because they have so much depth, and we see it week in and week out. Whether it's you know, guys filling in for injured players, guys filling in for suspended players, or simply rotational guys doing their thing when they get an opportunity, um, a la Tayshawn Bauer today. So there's so much depth. There's so many great players, and this is just such a team. And that's what makes this, you know, that's what makes this group so much more fun um, than ever. Is that they have a, you know, it's a great team chemistry, ton of lo- ton of like fun personalities in the locker room. Everson Griffin's pregame speeches are like a must watch every single week. Yep. I mean, I was thinking today because I remember back in Madden. I used to all when I when I played Madden when I was like in you know, 2008, 2009, back when I was in high school. Um, I would always do the fantasy draft option. I don't know how you do it, but uh, for me, I would go through and pick whatever, how like 50 rounds of players or whatever it is, yeah. just to build, you know, my perfect roster. And then I'd go out and I'd trade for all of my favorite players, like the Julio Joneses of the world or the Antonio Brown or whoever the guy was that year that I was in love with. Um, and now I just hit the franchise button and I roll with the Vikings because they have a really, really fun team. Top to bottom, they have personalities. They've got electric talent. They've got dynamic athletes. They've got, you know, everything. I mean, what doesn't this team have right now? And knock on wood, knock on wood. Yeah, <laughs> but in Madden, I do have a Lombardi trophy. So True. there's that. Um, that's why I think this team is peak proof. That's why I think this team can, can continue to win. And we've been preaching a sustainable defensive effort basically since the get go, um, since what we've seen, from, you know, at the beginning of this year. Uh, I think this is real. Uh, last year it was a five game sample size. Now we've got a 10 game sample size. Will the Vikings blow it again this year? Could they hypothetically still do it? Yeah, I guess. Uh, but I just think that this team is like, they seem to be adversity proof. And until proven otherwise, that's going to be my take here is simply that I don't think one player controls this team's destiny. And that's at, that's why this team can go all the way. Truly. That's the biggest, the biggest argument for why the Vikings can win the Super Bowl is simply because they are a 53 man team that doesn't necessarily need all 53 guys to be there fully healthy to win football games. And with injuries being such a constant now, that's why this team is truly I like a dark that. horse Super Bowl contender. I like that. I think that's a perfect way to end this show. Absolutely. Right so that is the end of the show then. Uh, we appreciate you guys tuning in for the Rapid Reaction Podcast. And for those of you that joined us on the About the Labor pregame show today, uh, thank you as always. Um, you guys were phenomenal with your bold predictions today. We saw Daniel Hunter get his uh, get his sack today. Um, we saw Sean Bauer get a sack today. Um, hey, Thielen almost had you know the big game. He, right. did, he was probably one big catch short from... Yeah, you guys were that mark, but everyone was nailed. Everyone was on point today from uh, from the show to the listeners to the Vikings themselves. Um, it's been a lot of fun, and I expect this fun to continue. So um, we will be back later on this week here uh, with the Wednesday edition when we'll break down kind of what what happened in this game. Um, I believe it's going to be on Tuesday, possibly. Well, we'll we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have to do a you know film re- review of this game slash right. a preview for the Thanksgiving game all right. kind of in oh, one. Wow, so. that's right. Yeah, we do have a short week here. Uh, so I think on Tuesday is going to be the round table for those of you that love that. Um, that'll be on YouTube. It should, I believe it'll be live. That's our plan. That's our tentative plan right now for that. Um, and yeah, Drew and I are going to have to run the hurry up offense here to get something prepared uh, for Wednesday, but it'll be a com- it'll definitely be a combination of br- re-breaking down this game um, and taking an in-depth look at an opponent that we have already looked at this year. So that we do have that benefit w- rolling for us, um, but Detroit has changed in a many in a number of different ways as well. So there are new things to talk about mm-hmm. and a bunch of different things to go on this week and um, obviously, we're going to hear very soon um, probably some more quarterback updates as well. So I'm sure this will be a you know a fun week of action here. Two games in what five days? Um, if the Vikings could pull this one out on Turkey Day, I mean, what that wouldn't s- suck. 
Well, yeah, that wouldn't suck. That w let's put it that. Let's leave it there. Let's table the excitement for now. We'll leave it. It at wouldn't that. suck. It wouldn't suck. That's how we're gonna leave it. So thanks for joining us, folks. VikingsTerritory.com. Hit the subscribe button on YouTube if you haven't already. iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, iHeartRadio. Find us on Twitter at VikingsATLPod, and we will catch you guys on Wednesday.